Welcome back to the Bentonville Beacon Podcast, where we're sharing stories and advice from the leaders sparking the rise of Bentonville, one of the fastest growing and most dynamic cities in the United States, nestled in the Ozark Mountains of Northwest Arkansas in the heartland of America. Hey, I'm your host, James Bell, and it's my pleasure to share the studio today with Vance Ravy, who is a serial entrepreneur and the founder and CEO of Junction AI. He's also a member of the Forbes Agency Council and has lived all over the world. And he recently moved here to Bentonville from Austin, Texas. Vance, welcome to the show. Thanks, James. Glad to be here. Good to see you again. So happy to be here today and talk to you, as uh, always, right? <laughs> you betcha. Well, hey, um, let's start out with you. Our audience would like to know about you. So what should they know about uh, Vance Ravy and your adventures around the world? Well, look, everything is actually on my dating profile. So, you know, I, <laughs> <laughs> we'll no. go check that out. We'll put that in the show notes. <laughs> exactly. No, um, you know, I guess, like you said, I've been a serial entrepreneur. I've, I've always been driven by this um, desire to explore and adventures and exploration just go hand in hand for me. And, you know, that's you mentioned, you know, live around the world. I've always wanted to go see new places, do new things, meet new people and and be part of it, not just to be a passerby, you know, just the tourist thing. I, yeah. I wanted to go live there, experience it you know, get in the troubles that you get into when you're somewhere new and don't know what you're doing or where you are or even speak the language Sure, and just have that experience. So, you know, I've, I've really enjoyed doing that my whole career in jobs or where I've decided to live or the projects or hobbies I've decided to tackle. Very cool. Well, um, let's talk about, or before we talk about Junction AI, let's talk about, I guess, the basics of artificial intelligence for business. What are the best use cases for AI for business and um, what's the risk for companies that aren't investing in AI right now? It's a really good question because we're at a really interesting point in how this technology has evolved. And I mean, you know, to a lot of us or to a lot of people who don't know much about AI, they just think it's something new. It's actually mm -hmm. been around for a very long time. The math is not new, the, you know, the algorithms and all that. There's been different renditions of it through time, but we're at a point now over the last, you know, decade or wherever where that cost of processing, cost of the, you know, the, the imaging chips and cameras, cost of data storage, all those things have come down so intensely that it makes so many things that we have thought about or tried to do in the past, but we couldn't get there, can be done quite quickly now, can be done affordably now, and can be done, you know, in a mass way as well. So that that's one of the exciting things that we've seen that, you know, have really set the stage for where we are today. And then over the last couple of years, you know, if you looked at the media, we've all seen fantastic headlines about what AI is going to do and sure. all kinds of things it's going to solve. Okay. That hype was fun, of course. It was great in many ways, but I think we're in a very positive space now where I, I've kind of been saying AI is almost boring now. Hmm. It's at the point now where it's just, it's a base technology that seems to be you know, getting embedded in pretty much everything that we're starting to use, do, and see. And that's a good place to be because that means we found really productive use cases for it that actually you know, maybe benefit the consumer, help automate something at a factory, help um, change manual things that really aren't adding a lot of value. The human there is not really necessarily, you know, they're not living their dream necessarily, or they're not sure. adding much value that a machine couldn't do, and it can move them into sort of roles that, where they can use you know, the unique characteristics that are human to advance what they're learning from the AI or taking with the AI is delivering them. So, you know, those areas of automation, intelligent automation, we've been through automation before. We've got those robots on factory lines and that, but, you know, we're talking now a lot about intelligent automation, which starts to move out into other areas beyond um, what we've seen in the past. So that, that to me is one of the most exciting places where we're seeing some development in AI. Cool. That, that is so cool. I mean, we're even starting to see it in economic development and, and tools for that. It's it's fascinating to watch all the places that uh, AI has really spread to uh, now. So let's talk about uh, Junction AI. Uh, what was the problem that was so compelling that you had to do something crazy like start a company? Uh, and what is it that Junction AI does? Well, it, it did start a little while back and we, we started actually in the marketing area, in the advertising area, um, because it was just an area that I found very fascinating because it involves imagery, it involves copy, it involves purchasing um, or trying to get a consumer to do what you want them to do. Mm -hmm. um, and it involves vast amounts of data, yet there still seemed to be so much unknown we got all these dashboards of all these metrics that say this much, you spent this much to do this and cost this much for this click and all that sort of stuff. And it always left me wondering, yeah, okay, I know what, but I don't know why. I still don't understand why. So that was what sort of drove, I guess, this passion I've had for figuring out the why behind things. 
and trying to understand why. Because if we know why, then we can avoid mistakes. We can make better plans. We can have better relationships. We can have you know, more effective strategies for things when we can understand why, because then it becomes something we can patternize, we can predict, we mm -hmm. can you know, adjust as we need to, but the why matters in everything. So why was always you know, my founding thing of like, why does this work? Why does this happen this way? So that's where it came from. And then as we evolved along, um, we didn't, you know, this is where fuel, you know, I know mm -hmm. we're going to get to that question, but this is oh, where sure. fuel really, really started to our pivot in that as we were doing this journey, we, we recognized there's some parts of the, the workforce that, you know, weren't ready for AI yet, or they couldn't change yet. There are other parts that could have more benefit from it right away. And we really wanted to show ROI. Like we thought it's really great that AI can do a lot of these things. And that's back to those media reports about all the cool things AI can do. But it's like, well, how do we know it's making a difference to the bottom line? Hmm. So part of our fuel experience um, was really doing, you know, really working along that pivot. And by that time, we had a couple clients that had said, you know, how did you how did you build this solution that you built? How did you get there? Because we've tried to build an AI solution for our team to do X, Y, Z or whatever it is. And they, they, they couldn't get there. They had hired outsourced developers. They'd hired their own in-house team to do it. They'd hired vendors and they'd spent a lot of money and didn't get there. Hmm. And it's it's partly that they missed some of the fundamental steps. So we almost by accident had, had stepped into that by saying, well, if we're going to build this app, we need to build this great big data transformation pipeline. We have to bring data in, we have to process it, pre-process it. We have to have a lab where we can do some experimentation. We have to have a factory where we productionize it. We have to have a consumption layer where we can spit it out in a way that a user can use it. All right, that's a lot of people. We can't afford as a startup to hire people, all the different devs and engineers and data scientists to do that all manually. So I've always, you know, I always want to find a, uh, a way to solve a complex problem simply. And you know, that's a Max Levchin thing. And I, I really have a lot of respect for how he breaks stuff down like that. So we thought, well, how can we automate so many pieces of this puzzle? So with a very small lean team, we can do all of that. We can take an interesting use case. We can run it through our platform and then we can, you know, deliver something that's useful and measure ROI. So, that pivot came around sort of without fuel time when we said, well, actually our platform is our product. This is something that people need because they have, everyone's got data, you know, everyone goes on about data, the oh, gold sure. or the oil or whatever. It's not, it's, it's just a raw resource. You got to do something with it to get there. And that cost of doing something with the data is really a stumbling block to actually then using it to be something else like an intelligent automation. Yeah. You know, that makes sense. You know, something you said, um, I guess we'll go on a little tangent here. Uh, it made me think about, uh, you know, oftentimes companies try to solve problems themselves that the problem in and of itself isn't the core core to what they do as a business. And, you know, sometimes the, pro the assumption is just that, oh, well, it's a problem and we can solve it. And then the problem turns out to be much more complex and they never really get to a solution. Yeah. Right. And that's why we need folks like you to come along and go, I'm going to build a business on that problem uh, because no matter how much you know about the problem in the, the way that you have it, sometimes you just can't solve it for that reason. Well, I mean, you nailed it right there because everyone thinks it's a technology problem. We, if, we, if we hire a developer, we hire a data scientist, mm -hmm. we can get on top of this, we can implement an AI to do whatever, you know? Yeah. That's not it. It's actually a big suite of skills. It's a lot of people with a lot of specialty skills and experience to actually get to that problem. Now, if you think about the average company or your own organization, well, can you pull your core team off what they have to do every day to get your roadmap and your responsibilities <laughs> for your customers or whatever you're doing? Can you pull that team off to all become experts in this? Who does all the other work that you already have to do? All right, this is, the, this is the classic situation where you need to bring in an expert vendor who all they do every day is live and breathe this. You know, they, they, my team love modeling. They love tuning models. They love interrogating data to find these sorts of things. That's their specialty. That's their passion. That's their love. You know, the heated arguments, not arguments, the heated debates or discussions we have about how to approach these sort of things, that's what we do and that's what we do best. So why wouldn't a company then want to say, well, let's work with people who are going to have that passion and who specialize in this one area to make sure we have success while we still use our resources on our core and make sure our core is still moving ahead in the way it should. So, cool. you know, that's, that, I think that's where, you know, and it's not just in what we do. I mean, we've seen this in so many things, like a lot of companies, you know, you used to host your own data. You have servers. Some people, you know, back oh, in yes. the day, you'd have, a, you'd have a server under your desk or in the basement, right? Now it's all on the cloud. Why, why would you use your core resources to do those sorts of things? They should be actually focused on your business issue, not 
data hosting. Let's let, you know, Google, Microsoft, whatever, let's let them do that, right? <laughs> yeah, that, that totally makes sense. Um, so you started off with uh, AI for marketing yeah. and, and and ads. What did that evolve to? Yeah. Is there a particular area that evolved to? So part of Fuel and, and I guess the Bentonville experience, why I was so interested in this experience here and coming to this town was, um, obviously, from the advertising side, we saw you know retail. You can't mm -hmm. disconnect the two, right? Yeah, no. And it was retail and e-commerce and those things. You know, that's that's where we can really see the number side of things, and see where the ROI has an impact. Like, was there actually sales difference? Uh, did we actually cut the cost of um, creating product listings down by having an AI write it for them or something like that? And this seemed the obvious place to come. Um, after I found out about it. I mean, I knew Walmart's headquarters was here. I was well aware of those sorts of things, but you know, I, did, sure. I didn't realize you know, all the other, all the other um, I guess, experience here and capability here. So we, we really wanted to dive deeply into the retail side of things because in, if you look at the AI universe, retail and supply chain are recognized as one of the main areas of opportunity for investment and benefit. Of, you know, mm -hmm. Pretty much all the areas, it's, it's in the top four, top five. And so... I needed to situate myself where I was going to be around these domain experts every day and soak up, like, you know, that whole sponge thing, just soak up everything I can from the community to learn and understand how I could take my understanding of this technology and the possibility of this technology, how I could then apply it to real business problems that are going to make a difference, be it product sales forecasting, which is what mm -hmm. we're doing now, um, using generative AI to write unique product descriptions that are suitable for every unique marketplace, you know, that understand the brand voice, that understand you, uh, this consumer versus this consumer, things like that. Like that can save, you know, as an example, it can take about an hour to write a really good product description. Sure. Well, an AI can write it in seconds or can write 10 of them in a few seconds or maybe, you know, still a second probably and let the human just pick which ones are right. Or let the human make the odd little change on it. You know, well, this, we'd use this word instead of instead of 100% polyester, we'd, we'd actually use vegan leather. Great. Well, now you've just taught your AI that substitute these words. So, you know, just that continual process. Yeah. So the next time you have to do that listing, it's going to even take less time. And that's real saves. That's really impressive. Um, wow. That's... Um that's amazing. Yeah, it's fine. I know. <laughs> I don't even know what to say to that. That's I, amazing. I, I'm always amazed by my team. They blow my mind almost every day. It's like, what? We, you know, I, I imagine this, but we can do this and we can do even more than that. Oh my God, this is great. Yeah. So, I mean, basically AI is not, I guess, w would it be safe to say it's not really replacing people. It's just making them a lot better at their job and putting people to a higher use. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you'll remember as well as pretty much everybody that the big fear was, oh my goodness, it's going to replace all our jobs and, you know, it's going to be mass layoffs and blah, blah, blah. And I was always a bit skeptical of that. And I was like, no, no, everything we've seen in tech actually ended up creating jobs That's and right. often creating higher paid jobs. And, um, you know, interesting different types of work not that other work wasn't interesting but new types of interesting work so yeah. we have to transition and where we are today i think is, is probably one of the most exciting things is that you know now that that hype's over it's it's like well what what is the proper role of ai in the workforce in the organization and, and how does the human work with that well it's actually a partnership it's not oh the ai goes and does something and we're just the recipient the human is the operator and that's where I think we're, we're getting to the really exciting stuff right now and the new types of jobs that are coming to the future. It's that operator role. It's not enough that the AI can do something. The human has to be able to guide it. You know, the, the, the vegan leather thing versus polyester. Mm -hmm. Got to teach it that. Got to teach it about, well, how do you want it to speak? You know, you've heard of chat GPT and all these new conversational sure. AIs. Great. Well, how conversational do you want it to be? Really chatty or very factual? That's a human that has to yeah. make those calls and, and, and guide it. And then how to apply it, you know, like how are we going to use this in better decisions or how do we, how do we explain it? So you've, you've obviously heard a lot about explainability in AI. If you don't have that human operator, that human involvement in it, then how comfortable do I feel taking these results, this data insight, am I going to take it up to the C-suite and stand behind it and go, hey, this is what we should do as a company. Oh, how do you get to that decision? Oh, I don't know. The AI I did. Know. Well, that's not good enough, right? So this new, this new exciting area we're going into, I think, right now is that that AI operator role in pretty much every organization could be education, could be health, could be retail. There's these operators that are going to be these trained people that know how to run it, how to train it, how to interpret it, how to use those results, how to share it in their group, you know, and apply it to yeah. make a difference. That's exciting. That those, is, are, those are cool jobs, I think. Yeah, that, that is very exciting. Well, I mean, there must be 
a lot of customers that, that you could have here uh, in Bentonville. I mean, when you think about Bentonville in the Northwest Arkansas region, you're right, as you said earlier, it's not just Walmart. There's 1,400 of their yeah. vendors and their, you know, their, their corporate offices of these vendors with decision-making executives. Uh, more often than not, they're the number one business unit in, in their companies. Um, and then you have the businesses that support those businesses. Uh, and it is an ideal situation in my mind uh, for startups and companies uh, on, on the growth curve because everybody you need to service is here. Um, you know, on top of those, about 400 of the Fortune 500. Of course, some of those, I'm double counting now, right, <laughs> as, as I just did, but still. No, I, I, you know, that's what really blew my mind. And I, I actually remember the day you came into Fuel, and it, I think it was our very first session, and these lovely gift bags from the chamber and all that mm -hmm. sort of stuff. But you started talking about these statistics about all these offices and the, these executive presence here, and often they're the biggest office. And before you know it, like, it was like, well, it was sort of like, oh, this is the Walmart place, but actually it really quickly became, no, it's actually, you know, name a brand, they're here. Right. Um, name a big service provider or a tech, you know, all the big tech companies are here. Um, they're all here for that reason too, because they all have a specialization in be it the logistics part, the supply chain part, the, you know, human management part, the, the retail part, the e-commerce part, whatever it is, they're all here with decision makers because they have that opportunity here, but then it's not just that opportunity. They're not just selling to you know, the, the giant here, they're selling yeah. that, they're selling that experience internationally, but right from here in Bentonville, that's exciting. Yeah, it, it is. It's a place. It's, it's that unexpected global experience. That was it. That's the perfect touch. word. It was totally unexpected. I did not know that. Well, we, we like to deliver the unexpected here. <laughs> um, who would you say, uh, as you think about that wide breadth of folks, what, what's an ideal customer look like for Junction AIs? If, if I was out walking around today and I saw that ideal customer, um, I would want to point them your way. Who would, what would they look like? So, you know, what most people would probably think is, oh, obviously the tech team. Mm -hmm. No, not the tech team. It's the business user. It's the product manager, the category manager, the e-commerce manager, uh, could be, a, you know, someone in the supply chain might be, they might have a C in front of their name, but they're probably more likely a director level, uh, could be the innovation people. It's all of those people that really have the responsibility for the business being delivering goods, selling goods, um, ordering the supplies, you right. know, that day-to-day -day business stuff that, that has to happen in order for them to actually be successful, profitable, smooth running, all the operations work, that sort of stuff. So that's why this town's great too, because those people are just everywhere here. <laughs> like, <laughs> they, they, they are. Um, you... And I get to learn from them all. So it's just wonderful, right? So th that's yeah. really, you know, and. The stories we hear, like we have one client and, you know, she talks about her e-commerce team and she just can't hire, like one, she can't find enough skilled people or hire enough people because the labor shortages and mm -hmm. that's probably not going to go away anytime soon. Um, and then two, should she be hiring that many people to do that job? Yeah. Well, no, she shouldn't be because she should be using technology tools like an AI to help assist in that job so that the people she does hire does have to hire or has on her team now can be retrained to then use it like we were just talking about. So, you know, I think that's what's exciting about this town because you, you can talk to those people, you can hear that stress that, oh, we can't find enough staff or we can't keep up to the competition or my goals this year, are, you know, this much bigger. What are the tools I can use to achieve that goal? Hmm. Interesting. So it's not that's that, the fun stuff. Yeah. I mean, uh, this is stuff that I find common across a lot of problems. It's not usually if you really think about it, it's not usually more people that you need. Yes, that's true sometimes. Yeah. It's not usually more people. It's not usually more resources except thinking is it's it's more tools, which I guess for resources. Um, it's more of the right tools and sort of multiplying people's knowledge and skills and ability to result in multiplied outcomes instead of more money and more people oftentimes there there's a better solution that's a great way to sum it up i'm going to use that I, go I like for that. it that's that's but that's exactly it it's like how do we use this the resources we have more effectively better probably making them happier in what they do too um and and you know achieve what we want to achieve like that's pretty yeah. exciting yeah yeah maybe we should quit using the words 
productivity and efficiency and so on, just call it multiplying. Yeah, just multiply. It, it's a, yeah. it's, I think it's a concept somebody can grasp. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, and it's spot on because if you think, all right, like that example, it takes me an hour to write a product list during an hour to create a forecast mm -hmm. and I can get a thousand of them done in a minute. That's not just, you know, adding. Yeah. That's, that is multiplying to a vast amount, vast degree. Cool. Um, so, you know, as you said, you, you were here, got here last year as part of the fuel accelerator. That's when I first met you on the, I think I might've met you before the first day, but uh, whatever the case is, at least by the first day. Uh, so real quick for our uh, audience, fuel is um, an accelerator that helps startups become enterprise uh, ready. Uh, and rather than focusing on, you know, uh, pitching, fundraising, sort of the basic aspects of starting a business, Fuel is more focused on creating operational value. Uh, that is, they match um, seed and, and growth stage companies with key enterprise partners in order to um, accelerate the adoption of tangible solutions or tangible technology solutions in this case. And they teach you how to navigate those enterprises and to get pilots with them and to sell to them so that now you can build and grow your businesses. Would that be an accurate description? Yeah, I think it's spot on. Yeah. Okay, cool. So will you talk then about fuel and I, I guess help audience understand how did fuel and, and junction AI find each other and what was your, you know, how did you decide, yes, I want to do this? What made you decide that? And then talk about the experience. Yeah, sure. Um, we had been through a couple of the accelerators prior, and they were great accelerators, you know, great learning opportunities, met some fantastic mentors, people I still work with today and sure. still count on today. And um, and I guess one of my things has always been, I take every introduction. I, I take every opportunity to introduction and every introduction. That's just the mantra I've always lived by. And, you know, when we were opening up with this, you know, that's this one of the things that's why I've lived in all these countries I've lived in and all these places I've been from Costa Rica to Australia is because I just take every opportunity. It's like, why not go for it? Go live there, go have an opportunity. So when the fuel opportunity came up, I got this email from them and I, I get a fair number of emails like you do. And I get yeah. invited to a fair number of accelerators. I was like, oh, another accelerator. Well, in Arkansas. Okay. I've never been where's there. That? Like, where's, where's that pretty much? I've never been there. What, what's this, you know, just right away. I was like, this is interesting. And okay, I got to have a look at this. It's about AI. Okay. I'll have a look at this. I started to see some of um, the other companies that have been through earlier cohorts and was like, okay, these are some very innovative companies and interesting companies doing interesting things. I'm going to look a little deeper and I'll respond to this email and, you know, hopefully get an interview. Hopefully they will mm -hmm. want to talk to me. And sure enough, they, I guess, did want to talk to me and then they wanted to talk to me again. And, um, uh, you know, and it was, a, it was a good interview process, but like any interview process, you know, you have that moment where you get to talk to the people and you kind of think, can I make a connection with them? Sure. Do I think I can have a relationship with them that's going to be really exciting or some interesting or teach me things or take me in, take me down the direction I need to go or assist me in that, whatever, right? And I've, I felt that immediately. I felt like these, these, they're not going to tell me how to do something, but they're going to help me understand and guide me in the way that's best for me to both at that time pivot my company, to understand where I was going and to put the resources in, in place for me like, you know, people I need to talk to, the introductions sure. I needed to to have at different times. Organize that all for me so I could make a better chance at being successful in my pivot and therefore my company. So, you know, that was really part of my thinking on that. Obviously, when you first see the fuel thing and you think, oh, it's town of Walmart and that sort of stuff, you think, oh, wow, I'd love to, you know, get a pilot with Walmart or whatever it is. But I think something that's really valuable about fuel is they're teaching you about enterprise sales and how to work in the enterprise world. And there are lots of ways in Mm -hmm. And like we were just saying, this huge ecosystem here of some of the world's largest companies, but also many other vendors that sell into that world, technology vendors, be it, you know, any, any sector really, right. <laughs> those are all opportunities as well for a, a startup. You don't have to sell to the biggest multinational around. And you, you probably shouldn't. You probably shouldn't. That's, and that's a, that's a teaching in there. You're not ready for it. Yes. You, you know, small, small startup company. And I've been on the other side, worked at banks and government and all that. I, I know actually what I've done to other companies from a procurement policies, from security policies, all those sorts of things. It's like long sales cycle, crushing for anything that's small. So it was, it was a lot of the teaching in there was like, how do you get in and where are the different avenues of ways of getting in there so that maybe in two years time, you're at the position you can be at a position of strength to really win, mm -hmm. 
to be profitable in what you win, to be able to manage it properly, to be able to deliver it properly. So that that is a depth of you know capability that every startup really needs when they have that vision of going enterprise. And again, that just draws to this area's natural strength. There are people that have been through that and have had that experience on both sides. So they can they can you know they can help you on maybe it's an IP issue, maybe it's a contract issue, a procurement issue, whatever it is. They can really help you avoid some pitfalls. That's really good. Um, I was thinking as you were talking about how giant, you know, a company is versus a, a startup. Um, I used to teach an MBA class. It was a capstone uh, uh, class and it was a business plan class that uh, I, I may have turned into a, a little bit more of how do you do a business model and now let's build a business plan and I'm going to make you pitch to me and, and so on. But uh, when we would talk about partnerships, um, you know, if you do, if you've ever done a business model canvas, there's a part of an, on it with partnerships. And every time I see somebody's canvas and they have a giant company listed on the canvas as a partner, I giggle. <laughs> yeah. And so in the class, my, my, uh, way of demonstrating how ridiculous that is, is I have a picture of a little bitty tiny house and then a giant skyscraper. And I just flip back and forth between it going, you, them, you, them, yeah. you, the partnership. No, it's no. not a partnership. No, no. yeah, it's not. Um, both sides should carry risk and yeah. It, both sides are useful to each other. I mean, be useful to each other. Exactly. Yeah. This, you, you know, that little house, the speed, you know, maybe I'm pushing the metaphor too far, but the speed that somebody can make a change or renovate it, like, yeah. you know, like a startup, we can move fast. We can, change right away. We can try something new right away. We don't have to go through five lines of hierarchy and all these different compliance groups. And, you know, we all know that can take sometimes years for big companies. And while they're not, not saying big companies aren't very innovative, they are, but there is a different speed that we can work at a startup. So that is an advantage to the enterprise. And obviously that's why they have directors of innovation that yeah. want to work with programs like fuel or the other accelerators, because they want to take advantage of that, that speed that we can move at. We don't have all those restrictions. And on our side, you know, maybe this is maybe this is why we can call it a partnership. We want the experience that we learn about their business cases. What's going to really move the line for them? What's going to make them want to pay us, right? So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's, that's a good thing to have. Yeah. Hey, what was the best part of Fuel and why? Well, besides meeting you. Um, oh, thanks, man. <laughs> appreciate shameless, that. Shameless, right? <laughs> um, I think it was the combination of the personalities. I mean, you know, your cohort there with you, mm -hmm. they're the people that can, un they understand more than anybody else on earth what you're going through as a founder. The ups, the downs, the highs, the lows, right. you know, the sleepless nights, the, 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 the little things that just are so exciting and so make you so happy, even though to anybody else in the world, it's like, yeah, so that person emailed you back, big deal. And for us, we're like, yes, score, we just got an email from X, you know, whatever. <laughs> so that's, there. that's, yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? It's, it's those sorts of things that it's just hard to explain to a lot of people, like why that matters so much. So that was, that was one important part because we had a really good camaraderie in the group and, you know, Tom, um, Douglas, uh, the, you know, and, and, and then it was Taylor and now it's, um, and Matt and, you know, great too, but they really created that environment that was open and safe for us to talk about these things, to share, mm -hmm. um, no judgment, you know, this wasn't, there wasn't a competition between us, nothing like that. Cause they try to recruit non-competitive companies. So we're not, you know, jealous of each other, chasing yeah. you know, like that. So we could be, you can be a lot more open. And there was that ability to be personally open, business open, dreams, values open. And, and those, those sort of things make a lot of difference. And, you know, and then obviously the, the, the connections here and stuff like that. So that's cool. Uh, what would you say to audience members who are like, wow, didn't know fuel was out there. Now I should check it out and see if it's for me. What would you say to them um, about whether they should check it out and how they should go about applying? And if they get that opportunity, whether they should do it, what, what should they be thinking about? I think like any accelerator, it's best to go in with really clear goal of what you hope to, and, you know, the, the goal, the, the milestone or the, the, the goal post or whatever the, the metaphor or cliche is, it might change very much while you're in it. Almost certainly. Yeah, yes. it, it will for sure. I mean, ours did, but you should go in there with a really good um, plan of attack of why you want to do it and, and recognize that you're going to have to put in, you know, double, triple time. 
Mm -hmm. Like know that you're going to have to clear your schedule. You're going to be working days and nights because you still got to run your own business, you know, and you still got to, but you got to create the time to learn. You got to take, like I said, take advantage of every intro, take advantage. So go in with the game plan, know what you're trying to achieve, be ready to change it, be ready to flip it if you need to, but yeah, have goals with it. Like, don't just go in there and think, well, what are they, what are we going to do? Like, no, they got to have a goal with that. So I, I, I'm a very goal driven person. So for me, that's very easy, but, but yeah. And yeah, awesome. the, you know, I also think it's important to try and find ways like I was here myself, but how can you also involve your team? Because it's not good enough just to learn yourself. You need to take, um, the materials from the course, the, the mentorships and all that you gain, how can you involve more of your team? And again, Fuel made that really easy with its materials, with the ability to bring people in for different things, or, you know, sometimes we'd be able to video in, you know, Zoom in other members of the team mm. for different sessions. So that sharing is really powerful too, because I'm, my company's only successful when I can have everyone in my company gain and benefit Yeah, and learn. So. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, you know, it, so, you were here and you got to discover a lot about your business, um, discover Bentonville. And at what point did you decide, Hey, something pretty magical is happening here, happening here in Bentonville and in Northwest Arkansas. And I have to be part of it. And I have to myself make the move to Bentonville. You know, I, I'm, I'm trying to think when it was that that actually happened. And I, like I said, I'd never been to Arkansas before coming here. Um, Wait, let me ask you real quick. Where else had you, because I think this um, it at least makes the answer more impressive uh, when you tell us where have you lived before? Okay, so I didn't answer that yeah, question. Yeah, Canada. I grew up in Canada, but I lived uh, in different parts of the country, everywhere from Quebec City, where I learned French. To, I went to university in Ottawa. When I was a kid, I lived in New Zealand as an exchange student for a year um, in Nelson, New Zealand. Uh, I then moved back there to, um, in my early 20s. Uh, started my first business there in Wellington. Then I got bought out and moved to Australia, became an Australian citizen, loved Australia, lived in, I don't know, numerous cities, Melbourne, Brisbane there. Uh, then I moved to Panama, then to Brazil, then back to Panama, then Costa Rica, and then to Austin. And yeah, so quite a few different places. So, um, Okay, so, what so, I've, had so lot, I've, had, I've had a lot of places to see, right? <laughs> right. When you think about these places, <laughs> like, a lot of those are here really cool Arkansas. places. <laughs> yeah. What What in the world uh, then made you decide? What was so magical that you then went? I have to be in Bentonville. People. It really awesome. came down to people. I mean, I, I, communities full of great things. So many great opportunities. There's so many great things. But I, I think I've shared this story with you before. I just couldn't believe it. Only after a few days here, I'm walking down the street and people are saying hi on their porch to me. I'm like, how do these people even know me? They don't. They see me walk a few times. So I got my own lawn chair from my own porch. And before I unfolded it, the woman, some woman yelling out hi to me. And I was like, man, <laughs> you know, you're in the lineup at the farmer's market and people just start talking to you. And, and the generosity, the community, the spirit, the, the givingness of the community, the friendliness of the community. So I immediately felt really comfortable with the community and just thought this is actually a really positive place to be because not everywhere is positive, right? Yeah. Um, there's lots of good people everywhere for sure, but not everywhere you feel surrounded by people that are positive and energetic and loving life and loving taking advantage of what they're doing and, you know, going that extra mile to be good communities. That was really appealing. I was, I was wowed by that. Yeah. I think of this place as being a place where you belong, right? Yeah where you just simply belong and you don't just have that feeling, but you know it. Yeah. Yeah. I was walking, you know, it, it would hit, it would hit me every now and then that beautiful trail going down towards crystal bridges from downtown. Oh yeah. Trees, the odd deers walking by, you know, <laughs> other people smiling and talking about things. And you just suddenly have this sense of like, I just feel quite happy. I just, feel happy. You can hear some music maybe from Crystal Bridges because there was a band one day there. I don't know, just sculptures in the gardens and stuff like that. You just yeah. have this little sense of like, feeling kind of happy right now. Hmm. That's kind of interesting. That's a good feeling. I like that. Everybody <laughs> should be able to live in a place that just brings you happy. A little bit of that little bit of joy, right? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Well, how is um, thinking about Bentonville's entrepreneurial ecosystem and startup community, how is it different than other places you've you have been, and maybe in the context of that also, you can answer uh, other resources here beyond fuel that you've been able to tap into. So one thing I've really learned from living in all the different countries and cities and doing all the different things I've done and all the startups I've had and all the jobs I've done is that in, like innovation is exciting everywhere. And everybody has different mm. ways of showing innovation. Um, 
we what we consider you know probably what you and I even consider common sense is different, and that really can drive innovation in different and exciting ways, and that that always fascinates me. So whether you know sometimes you live in some countries where the power is going out all the time, um, and that you know it takes innovation to get around. How do you manage that in a sure. day, right? Um, but here. You know, obviously, from my work from point of view, I was really impressed by the commitment to innovation here by a lot of the companies, what they were doing, their visions of where they saw the future and how they use these different technologies. Um, and that, that was quite exciting to just think, OK, I'm, I can probably I can probably live out some of the innovation dreams that I've been thinking of and learn from obviously that great experience of the, the people that live here and work in these companies, learn what they see the future is from an innovation point of view. Well, wow, that that's that's like an exciting conversation to have, and you can have that conversation a thousand times over here with whoever you meet because they all come from. So many people have worked internationally here, have worked mm -hmm. for these companies. They're sharing those experiences, whether they you know spent two years at the global office here, or they were at the outpost in South Africa or Mexico or wherever it is for whatever CPG company or. Like they've all collected those experiences from all the places they've lived. And I, I could recognize that in me. I was like, hey, that's kind of how I feel about things. I've collected all these little bits of learnings and innovations from around the world. Wow, it's really exciting to meet other people that feel the same way and want to, you know, go from there. And what's next? What are we going to do next? What are we going to learn next? How can we apply it? Like, that's, that's just fun conversation. Yeah, you know, uh, Bentonville is a place that's diverse in many ways, but one of them that's really overlooked in most places is this diversity of experience and backgrounds. And, and here with 64% of the people not even having been born in the state of Arkansas. Yeah. Uh, but as you said, coming from all over the world, um, where where else but to be here? Yeah. As an innovator, all the great ideas and, and they come from random many of the, the great ideas and opportunities come from random collisions with people and just <laughs> exactly. discussions and random discussions. Yeah. That's how innovation happens. That's it. Exactly. Why wouldn't you want to be in a place like yeah. that? Yeah. We, and, and because it's quite small here, maybe it's because 64% of the people here are from somewhere else. Maybe we don't have the barriers here and the, the stratification, like, right. you know, we're not in one of the bigger cities where, oh, you're not part of this group or you haven't got this title or you're not living in this neighborhood or, you know, all those false barriers that create blockages to having experiences that you might otherwise have that you can't plan or you can't schedule. Um, the, the, they haven't got, you know, I haven't really found that attitude here. Not snobbery. I'm not trying to say it like that, like that, right. you know, it's not like other cities are that way, but there is, there's sort of a stratification of that. If you're not in the right group or in the right list or all that sort of stuff here, it's, it's really just everyone wants to meet, learn, engage because they've all been from everywhere else. It's like everyone here is new from here, right? <laughs> That's exactly right. I've heard people say that there are no new kids in schools here. Because <laughs> everyone's new. Everybody's a new kid, right? Uh, we build, and to give our listeners an idea of how, like, um, to give you an idea, we build one new school a year here. Wow. I've lived in cities where... We didn't build anything in 20 yeah, years, right? Yeah. Uh, maybe replaced a school or something, but one new school a year. Wow, that's incredible. It, it is crazy, huh. crazy incredible. Um, what are some of the other resources? Did you get to tap into any of the resources from the University of Arkansas or for any other uh, ESOs here, entrepreneur support organizations? Yeah, that for, again, you know, population-wise, what comes mm -hmm. off as a relatively small place, <laughs> it's kind of mind-boggling how much there is going. And I don't know if that's maybe because it is small, so it's easy to get to everybody that you need to, or whether it's just that dynamic of a community. And I kind of mm -hmm. think it's obviously both. But um, we, we've we worked with the intern programship, uh, or intern, intern program at the University of Arkansas. Really, really enjoyed that. We've had five interns now over wow. three different semesters. And just, you know, impressed with how, easy and well organized it is it's just painless i mean couldn't be couldn't be happier with how we worked with them and the results with that so that was great then you got million you know million cups and wednesday mornings here where it's just a great opportunity to meet and network um there's a lot of other fellow entrepreneurs here occasionally we get together um there's different panels i mean you've had me speaking i think once at a university panel mm -hmm. answering some questions from students so there's so much going on like that that it is really really 
it, it comes down to like, well, how much time do you have to get engaged and, and go do these things? Because there's so many different events like that. The Tech Summit, which has right. always been good. I've been to, you know, two of them now. Um, really met a lot of interesting people there and not just interesting people, but people that now I've, are helping me advance my business or doing new introductions for me. So useful. You know, that's a great Excellent. thing about a conference when it's actually conferences are fun, but you kind of want them to be useful too. Yep. Yeah. A absolutely. Well, I mean, the magic in conferences isn't the speakers, it's who you get to engage with. And so uh, a track you want to, a lot of folks think about the speakers that they have to attract when in fact, what they should really be thinking about is the attendees they want to attract because then they have to figure out the speakers instead of, you know, it, it's like I a mean, the magic way happens it, with, the, with yeah. the attendees. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Cause yeah, you need to stimulate those attendees and get them interested. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and find ways to get them to uh, engage. Yeah. Or to naturally the more engage. they engage, the more likely, you know, they're not going to win a contract off the speaker. Right. But yeah, they could, they might've just made their next business contact, business contract with someone they were sitting next to. And if you, if you create that environment, like this place is great at, um, where they can just be f openly chatting with each other, go have coffee, or, you know, then they just might've made a new business opportunity or found their next hire or whatever, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I wanna be mindful of time. So as we work through this, uh, let's, um, I'm gonna skip down my list of, of some <laughs> things I was thinking about talking with you about and ask you, as somebody relatively new to Bentonville, uh, I'm curious to know about some of your favorite places uh, here that you've enjoyed so far, whatever's important to you. Well, I love the running, the biking trails. I'm a runner, so I love the, the biking trails. I love the fact that, you know, everywhere says they've got work-life balance. Everyone says it's, you know, great for that. This place lives work-life balance. <laughs> I, I can I can literally go up my door and I'm on one of those beautiful trails. Um, wow. You know, and, they're, and it, they're just beautiful. Not just the scenery, not just how well they're kept, but there's art along them and things like that, too. I can, I can... I can duck into the momentary. I mean, there's, I tell friends and family that come here, it's like, and you don't have to pay. Right. You can just pop in there for 20 minutes if you just want to see a couple of pieces of amazing art. Enjoy it and don't get overloaded because you can go back tomorrow if you want. You can go back next weekend if you want. So, right. yeah. So I, I think, you know, Crystal Bridge is momentary. Fantastic for that. There's some really good restaurants. And I'm a foodie, total foodie. So there's some fantastic restaurants in this town and I'm really enjoying them. And there's new ones that have been opening. So, it's, you know, mm -hmm. that's, that scene is pretty exciting. So a few, few of my favorites like that. Excellent. Um, in fact, why don't we call it uh, a play game? I like to call local favorites. Okay. And today's rules are, I'll name the subject area. You name the favorite locations, uh, but you're limited to, of course, Northwest Arkansas. And if you don't list one in Bentonville, you of course <laughs> also have to list one in Bentonville. Uh, favorite places to get outside and enjoy nature? Uh, the trail that goes past Crystal Bridges, down past the, the water treatment plant, and then out to the Bark <laughs> yeah. Park. I love that trail through there because that's beautiful. That's a cool trail. I love it. Uh, favorite places for food and drink? I love Preacher's Son, and I also like Conifer. Just newly opened, and it's great. Oh, I so innovative. I haven't been to Conifer oh. yet. Preacher's Son is amazing. Yeah, awesome restaurants. Uh, favorite piece of public art? I'd have to say the Chihuly pieces in the sculpture garden at Crystal Bridges. I love the glass oh, yeah. work. I love the, the way it captures light, the colors, and then to have you know the beautiful forest around it, the way that interplays with it too. It just it seems like an unnatural thing to have something hard and glass structural out in the, the, the soft organics, but to me, that interplay is beautiful. I love that. Um, favorite places to show off to people when they come to visit? Uh, well, besides the Ozarks um, and the great restaurants, I love the farmer's market. Really enjoy showing people that because I think they get a really good sense of old and new Arkansas. You mm -hmm. can see all of it there from, you know, I've had friends from Dallas and all kinds of places all over the world come here and they're just like, this is such a mixed community. Like you don't think you're going to get this diversity of people here. And that farmer's market sort of just really nails it. And then the, the DC 21 hotel, I love their artworks there too. So it's oh, yeah. kind of like, what here, those penguins, like there's only a few other places in the country with that sort of stuff. So it's, it's just that, that surprise factor here. It's like in this town, like how come we've never heard of this? Right. Again, the unexpected. Yeah. Um, okay. You kind of told one earlier, but I'd like to know, uh, tell me a hashtag because Bentonville story. And that's a story that could only happen here or maybe describes the essence of this place or just a moment in time. Well, I've already told you my, my porch lawn chair story. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, another one that really turned me on to this place is I was walking home with all my grocery bags because I don't have a car and I don't need one. I live downtown. And, um, 
twice this has happened to me now, people have stopped, total strangers have just stopped and said, hey, can we give you a ride? Do you need help? Oh, like, nice. No, I'm just having a walk. It's fine. I was like, wow, who does that? You know, total strangers. Who does that? Like, you know, and you know what? I wasn't suspicious either. I was like, okay, that's not, it's not a weird panel van and they're going to take me away. They're not offering me candy. <laughs> you know, it's funny you say that because I would not think of myself as a person who would do that. I would not have thought of myself before I moved here as a person who would do that, who, who would do that. And something about this place just creates that it's, in you as well. I yeah. mean, yesterday I saw this couple and they're standing outside, uh, the, the, the first, the first Walton five and dime. And of course, right now it's being renovated yeah. and they're looking at the sign, you know, that they're taking pictures and they're looking at the sign that says, Hey, the, the museum is temporarily moved. It's in the ledger building. And I haven't read the sign. Maybe it gives them directions on how to get there. And it's not very far, but I found myself stopping and asking <laughs> him, Hey, you want to lift over to the uh, ledger? Like, I'm about to pass right by there. It's just around the corner. I but mean, how weird is that? Like, yeah, I, I would have never. <laughs> yeah, it, living in other places, I would have never. No, uh, fought no. to do that. No, um, yeah, it, it, if people are something about this place that also just makes you more kind. Yeah, I, uh, I think that's it. It know? brings out. It brings out. And maybe maybe, it's it, maybe it just allows thing. you to. Maybe it's the happiness thing. Maybe yeah. it's that you don't feel. Yeah, you're not being pressured in all these different ways. Whatever it is it maybe opens up you to be happier or to be more open to people, to be more trusting. And I don't know, it's, it's a good feeling, right? Maybe that's it. Yeah, I love it. Um, as we start wrapping up, um, I think I'd like to hear more about your views on AI and also hear some advice for entrepreneurs. So I wrote myself a few questions okay. here. The first one is, what are <laughs> that you can say on my show? Um, what are the weirdest uses of artificial intelligence that you know about. Yeah, okay, so I can't, I can't say too much about this, but I saw an example where they were um, they were resurrecting or they were using AI to like you know the deep fakes of mm -hmm. of dead people and to have oh, yeah. them talk and discuss and have personalities and like almost like you could engage them and I, I thought that was just really strange. I mean, the idea of a deep fake is one thing, but the idea of having a conversation with someone who's passed and gone that was kind of like, okay, interesting. That's kind of weird because then I could think, well, geez, I wouldn't mind having a chat with Winston Churchill maybe or, or you know, someone like that. I, I, I don't know how we'd ever train an AI on something like that mm -hmm. maybe, but whatever. But I thought that'd be kind of interesting, wouldn't that? Wouldn't that be neat if that technology was ready for prime time and, you know, the, the U.S. Constitution exhibit just left the, uh, just left Crystal Bridges and, you know, there was a copy of the, Federalist Papers and the Declaration of Independence and the Emancipation Proclamation and the uh, one of the uh, amendments to the Constitution, some other stuff, but or the uh, Articles of Confederation uh, as well. And these are all like original copies, and you can read about the the concept of original copies uh, on your own time. But <laughs> but um, the conceivably if they wanted to try this maybe starting with the federalist papers and the founding yeah. fathers would be a good place because there's enough information there that they could be how cool would it have been if there was a, an exhibit yeah. as part of yeah. that where you could interact with the founding fathers yeah and if we can get it to the point where it's natural the interaction's natural yeah. it's not you know prescriptive or like a scripted one which is what we pretty much have today but to have it to natural to have them have personalities to have them be moody some days maybe whatever <laughs> it is right like Maybe it was, maybe it was. Uh, some of those debates probably were intensely oh, I'm sure. angry and, in, you know, arms in the air and everything. Like, actually, to be witnessing it in that way, wouldn't that be cool? And then, you know, and I think of other ways of doing it. It's like, okay, well, what if I'm cooking up some cool recipe that I've never done before? Doesn't have to be a dead person, but what if, you know, Martha Stewart could go, sh you know, mix AI, AR, and VR together? Yeah. What if she can go shopping with me at the farmer's market? Oh, we can man. talk ingredients, how hey. to get the best result from this, whatever. Right. I don't know. Like, I think it's great fun things like that. What if we too could cook with Martha Stewart and yeah. Snoop? Yeah. Oh, oh, <laughs> yeah, I'd, right? I'd be liking that. <laughs> <laughs> how much fun? Would that I mean, exactly. Be? Like, how much fun? Like, there's so many things I think that are coming up that we could do. That'll be a lot of fun. Oh my goodness! Yeah, that's that, that's way fun. Uh, what's something about AI that many people believe that just isn't true, whether that's good or bad? Um, 
I'm not really sure. I think, you know, the, the, the technical question, a technical answer to that is they think it's one thing, but it's actually not. The, the AI is a whole series mm -hmm. of different techniques, everything from machine learning to robots to that. But actually, maybe I'll just turn that answer around a little bit in that um, it's probably the fear factor, but people don't realize how much AI they're already using today. If they sure. had any idea how much AI is already part of their lives, they, they, they just don't realize it. I mean, every time you're using Google Maps, that's an mm -hmm. AI. It's telling you all these different paths. It's figured that all out for you. You know, we're just using it every day and don't even notice it, don't even recognize it, but get these enormous benefits out of it. So I think it's probably the, the biggest thing is that we're just not cognizant of how much it actually plays a role already in our lives today. Sure. I mean, at the top of the show, you mentioned it's been around a long time. Yeah. It, this is not new yeah, stuff. Yeah, new. Uh, I always joke, you know, math's not new. We didn't invent it just recently. <laughs> that's, that's right. What's something that you believe about AI that may surprise people? Um, hmm. That's a good one. I'm not really sure on that one. You don't have to have an answer. Yeah. I, yeah. Okay. We'll go to the next you one. You know, I think it's on, <laughs> I think it's probably on the ethical side in that, okay. you know, it, uh, this is that driving, the, this is the self-driving one um, around, it's not that AI isn't really good at self-driving. It actually is very good and very safe already. It's that we are not ready for it yet because it's that, that classical ethical thing of I'm in my car and there's a bus load of 40 kids coming. The AI has got to decide which car is going to crash, which, yeah. you know, who, it's, it, that's not an AI problem. That's a human problem. That's us to tell it what to do. The AI isn't going to choose those things until we've told it to, what it chooses. So I think people probably give it a little more credit and a little more power, but ultimately it is a human operator that feeds his things in. Mm. That's really good. If you weren't wor working on Junction AI, and in fact, if you weren't working on anything in tech at all, what would you be doing? I would be uh, renovating houses and um, doing landscaping and stuff like that. Because okay. I, th I've, every time I've sold a company, I retire as they uh, <laughs> badly retire, let's put it that way. And I have to jump into something right away. And I buy old homes and flip them or I, I learned to, you know, design homes and stuff like that and built a few. And uh, I just love being able to do something with my hands that's not in front of a computer and love getting the hands dirty. I, I know to do plumbing, you know, septics, you name it, all that sort of stuff. I've <laughs> taught myself to do it. So I love doing it because it's like, you can see what you've done, you know, build a rock wall. It's right there. You got the bruises from it. I, I just love that feeling. So I, I'd be doing that. Oh, that's And cool. surfing. And, and surfing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Well, cool. We can handle half that equation for you here. I think. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if the Mars are listening out there, you know, fixture to fabulous. Maybe they can exactly. hire you, you for uh, some, some hey, side jobs. Hey, I've done nine properties pitching. now, so you yeah. know, I'm, I'm available anytime. Yeah, I heard that. Fans is ready and available for you. <laughs> um, he might even do the work for free just to. I do. Nah, well, nah, yeah. Yeah. Won't do that. Yeah. All right. Two more questions then. Uh, if somebody wants to reach you or learn more about Junction AI, how do they do that? All right. Uh, junction a, junction AI is the web address and I'm on LinkedIn, Vance, Ravy. It's only one of me in the world with that name. So shouldn't have too much trouble finding me. Awesome. Uh, or they can contact you and you'll put them in touch with me, right? Yeah, sure. There you go. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Last question. The easiest one of all. What's something I did not ask you that I should have asked? what the best advice my parents ever gave me was. Oh, that's cool. What's the best advice your parents ever gave you? Do the things that you want to love doing, that you're passionate about doing, and the money will come, and the, you know everything, everything else will fall into the place. They never told me, oh, go be a doctor, or go be a lawyer, or go do this. You know, my dad was a farmer, my mom was a potter. It was like, you know, I want to be a politician then. I was going to be the prime minister. <laughs> um, but it was, they never said, no, don't be ridiculous. You're not going to be prime minister. It was chase it. Just go chase the things you want to chase and you will find the happiness, the money, love, all those sorts of things comes from doing that. So I have absolutely lived that my entire life, whether it was moving to any country I wanted to go to, whether it was starting a company, working, trying a job that I'd never done before. You know, there's, there's no risk when, when you start from that position, mm -hmm. risk takes on a different meaning. There isn't a risk wow. then, right? The yeah. risk is not doing it because you might not be happy then, or you might not find love, or you might not find joy that would be a horrible thing to miss out. So just having that start in my life to say, just go do the things you want to do. Everything else will fall into its place. That was powerful. That is powerful. I'm, well, I'm thankful your parents uh, gave you that. I am too. That's, what, a, what a gift. <laughs> I was so lucky. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, you know, Vance, thanks for spending time with me thanks, and James. the Bentonville Beacon audience. Um, I, I'm thrilled, of course, that you chose Bentonville and that you're able to sort of live your best life here and uh, that 
I got to meet you and that that we've become friends. I've this enjoyed that too. And you know, you were the you took me to my first uh, American football game. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that was the homecoming game. Uh, uh, was it twenty we were, into twenty one in we're November? Playing Auburn, Auburn, uh, exactly. A tough that, loss. Yeah, it was. It was um, a sad loss. And yeah. um, but that was my first. Um, Let one get away from us. American football game, and that was pretty exciting. Pretty happy, and you know, we've we've, we've been great friends since. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, well, you first of all, you shouldn't schedule another SEC team for your homecoming. You're just <laughs> asking for it, except for maybe. Vanderbilt. I don't know. And then to find uh, out my sister was watching it on TV and was sledging Arkansas. I was like, how could you? You traitor. <laughs> Abs absolutely. Well, hey, thanks again. Yeah, thanks. And uh, thank you to our Bentonville Beacon audience. You know, without you, the show wouldn't be possible. We'd love to hear from you. I'd love to hear from you about your thoughts about the show and how it's going. Uh, my email is letter J, last name Bell, B-E-L-L, -L, at greaterbentonville.com. Uh, keep coming back to the podcast to learn more about Bentonville's leaders and their businesses and uh, how this place helps you live your best life. Uh, and visit BentonvilleEconomicDevelopment.com to see all of our episodes and to learn more. And as always, hit subscribe on your favorite podcast player and please share with your friends. Have a great one.